Okay, so we're going to learn the Mimer, Erdana Ve'ere, which is based on the uh, Mimer that's in Torah's Chaim, which is another book by him, which is a expanded version of Torah's, Torah Or. So in Torah Or we saw a Mimer either last year or the year before called Erdana Ve'ere Ketzakata, which explains the difference between God's knowledge um, of reality, the way that people imagine that it is, and the way that it really is. Okay. And he says, why does God have to come down to see? So obviously the coming down is a symbolic term, and we learned what it meant. Uh, in, short, in short, it meant that he came down from the Sovev into the Mamali. Okay, but... As we go through this, we'll, we'll look at more, more things from the Torah or Mimer. So God says, I will go down to see what is going on in Sodom. Is it like the scream that I've heard? It's scream, it's cry that has come to me, that they've done such terrible things. And if not, I will know. That's the those, that's the pasuk. That's the verse in the Chumash, right? And it's in chapter eighteen, verse twenty-one. It also says there that after God saw, He went to Abraham and He told him, "I'm going to destroy Sodom." Meaning that Abraham received a vision, he received a prophecy that this is what's going to happen. And Abraham tried to dissuade God from doing that. So before God goes to Abraham, he says, Shall I conceal? Can I possibly conceal something from Abraham who serves me? Meaning, in other words, as somebody who's taken responsibility for the well being of humanity, sort of like the, the Moshe Rabbeinu of that generation. And why would I want to do something, says God, terrible, like destroying people without giving him a chance to rectify the situation? But it, it's not exactly that God comes to him and says, look, go to Sodom and make them do tshuva, and make them repent. That's not, that's not what he tells him. He says, I just want him to know. It doesn't sound exactly like God is open to... Um, Room for, for, for change going on. It's more like, I need to reveal this to, to Abraham. And the question is, why? Why does he need to reveal it to Abraham? Midrash. In the Medrash, there's the obvious question. Really, the Medrash here is the Gemara and Brachos. Is there such a thing as doubt before heaven? That, they, that God wouldn't know, is Sodom really guilty or not guilty? Should I destroy them? Should I not destroy them? And the answer that they give in the Gemara, V'tirtzu, Shi'arad mikiseh din lekiseh rachamim. So they set up, the sages of the Talmud, they already set up the answer that we talked about a few minutes ago, that God moved from his throne of judgment to the throne of mercy, of compassion. And that's what it means to go down. Okay? To go down is to go down from the throne of judgment and to sit on the throne of mercy. Still, this, their answer is, is just the beginning. It's, n- it's still not understood in, in our minds. We don't understand exactly what these terms mean. Because really, this is a very big question that they ask. How could it possibly be that in the heavens, they would have a doubt regarding the actions of the physical world. The actions of those who are low means the physical world. For there is divine providence over every single act done here in the physical world. And as we say every morning, Right, that God uh, uh, um, prepares the footsteps that I'll walk in today. Meaning that's already even 
to a sense predetermined. It's guided by heaven. And it says in Tehillim, right? Where is this? Uh, don't remember? Yeah, Tehillim Lamed Zayn, okay, 37, that God forms all the hearts and He understands all their actions. And following this thing with the footsteps, the sages say in Chulin, that a person does not bump his small toe without it being decreed from above. Right? A lot of people think that We talked about this once. Nokefetzmo, they think it means to, to lift his finger. But it doesn't mean that. Lakuf at the with a kuf, means to hurt it by, by bumping into something. So everything is decreed from above. So we understand from this that even every organ of the body is watched over from above. So how can there be a doubt regarding what the creatures in the lower realms have done? Because it, 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 the, from the verse, the literal meaning of the verse in the Torah, in our Parsha, is that he went down to see whether they had done what, he, what it sounded like they had done. If not, that really God doesn't know. So now he has to come down to find out. And yet everything is from God. This is also, surprisingly, and he switches now to a completely different direction. He says, this is exactly what we do when we contemplate the notion of Shema Yisrael. The hero of Israel, God is our God, God is one. Havaya is our God, Havaya is one. Why? What's the connection? Ki v'vadaya kol yodim sh'ashem d'varach bara v'asa kol. Ki ena d'var osay et atzmo. It's because normal people don't think that anything made itself. Okay. Maybe somebody who wants to, <laughs> to question can, can say that, but a normal person understands that everything has a reason, everything has a cause. So nothing made itself. So what are we adding by saying that God is one? So he says, really what the problem is, is not that people don't believe that the world was created. But they believe that the world was created and then there's no connection between the creator and the creation. That's the issue. Right? Divine providence is the problem, is the question. So it's only in the sense of knowledge, but not relation. Okay? And this is interesting. The, here, here he sets up the, the, the words. Yedia means to know of something. But shayachut, to have a connection with, to have possession of. Okay? Possession is like uh, you need das in order to have kinyan, right? It's a famous principle of Talmudic uh, uh, learning. That in order for there to be possession, for a person to be able to purchase, to, pure, to, to change the ownership over an object, there has to be consciousness, there has to be knowledge of that object. But you see from this that there are two different levels, that knowledge of the object, knowing the object, is just, or knowing the act of purchasing, being aware of it, right, Yaakov, is only a first stage in possession. To possess, to buy, to purchase requires that, but it's more than that. Why? Because you're setting up a new relationship with the object in question. So when I come to buy something, it's not enough that I mean that I have in my mind that I'm going to buy. It's not enough that I know what I am buying. I can't buy something that you don't show me. I can't buy something that doesn't exist in the world. There has to be knowledge. What? And they take responsibility for it. But they're showing you. That's why you have to, to see it. And say, the classic 
the classic uh, example in ancient times, was that you could not buy meaning, you could not sanctify a woman, you could not marry her, unless you had seen her, and unless you meant to. And she also, she also needed das, she also had to have a knowledge. She had to see who was marrying her, and she, ha- she had to have consciousness, awareness, that she was being sanctified. It couldn't be a trick, it couldn't be a, couldn't be a, you know, a game that they were playing. So what does it mean to contemplate that God is one? But his boninus to meditate on this means to deepen the consciousness of it. And now we're going to deepen is like possession. It's like a new level of consciousness. It's not the, just the regular awareness. And what do you see comes out of it? That because you meditate on this principle that Havaya is our God, Havaya is one, from that you come to Vahavta, you come to love God. So when the awareness is not just a technical act, it also awakens a relationship, then that relationship causes you to have feelings. You can't have an awakening of the heart until there's a deeper consciousness of what you're looking at and a relationship formed. Okay, so he says, the problem with God having created everything is not, that's not the issue. The question is whether he created everything and he has a relationship with it, whether he cares for it or not. So when people say, God... God didn't create this. You see, he's saying what he's saying is, it's not that they've suddenly lost their minds and they don't understand that everything has to have a cause. They understand that. What they're bemoaning is the fact that they don't feel that God has a relationship with what he created. It seems like he is oblivious to it. Made it to Indifferent. It and it still it's still here. He, maybe he keeps it even going, but he's indifferent to it. He doesn't care. But there's still a very strong question that the philosophers ask about providence, about God's, how would you say, steering his care for the world. Because the awareness that God has, or the care that He has, is about every individual particle of creation. Every prat, every individual part has separate hashgacha, has separate providence. Because we see that some of the um, uh, uh, vegetables or the plants are now in a state of growing, and others are in a state of decay. And on, on one field there will be rain, and on the other field there won't be rain. And even in human endeavors, whether your business transaction will cause you profit, or lead to losses, everything is under divine providence. You have no blade of grass below that doesn't have a mazal, that doesn't have a type of angel, if you want, or a divine force that strikes it and makes it grow. So there must be divine providence over these forces, over these angels as well. So, what is he saying here? There are levels of providence from the smallest detail in creation to the most general force. God surveys them all. How can that be? 
וכמו כן בעולם הבריאה יש גם כן מבחינת השגחה פרטית והשגת הנשמות בלוקות, והכל מבחינת התחלקו פרטים, ועל זה הקשו, האך יוכל להיות מבחינת השגחה בהתחלקות רבות כזאת, מבחינת אחדות הפשוטה. How could God's oneness divide itself to watch over, to, 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 to guide every one of these details? There's many, many of them, infinite number. מבחינת אין סוף הפשוט. שהוא מבחינת עצם פשוט מופשט מערך ומציאות התחלקות פרטים, שהוא היפוך הפשיטות. How can something that is abstract, that has no body, that has no form, how can it affect every single one of these details, which is obviously with form and with body? Sometimes this question is not understood, because people think the question here is how many times can God split his attention? The problem is not how many times he can split it. The problem is how can he can split it even once? If he's one, then what does it mean? I mean, it, it should have been, this, and this is how the, the philosophers conceived of it. This is called the Greek, right? This is called the Greek ishtalshalus, the, 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 the emergence of reality from the one by the Greeks was impossible. That's one, that's one example of, of, of how it's split. Okay. But for that, you have to assume, and that's the problem. That was the problem with Greek philosophy. You have to assume that the world existed before God began to take care of it. Okay. Understand? Why? Because think about, the, think about what you just said. I have the sun. Again, you're right. This is the this is the explanation. One of the explanations offered. Again, as an explanation, it's it's a it's a metaphor. So you have to a parable. So the parable is that the sun is like the sun's light is like divine light, divine revelation, and it enters into every one of the windows of every single house in the world separately. So you see that the sun is still one. It didn't become many because of that. And yet it entered into many, many different uh, spaces. Yeah, but those spaces existed before the sun began shining. You can't say that the sun shining created or provided for the separation between the spaces. These houses, they existed before the sun rose in the morning. So of course the sun went into each one separately, because they already existed. That was the conclusion of Greek philosophy. That you can't have both. You either have to say... that the world is just as timeless as God, and so therefore they saw God as just a mover, as something that's just animating everything. It's giving life to something that was crude before, that wasn't alive yet, but it had to exist before. It had to exist. Otherwise, there's no way to understand how it could split into all these myriad uh, houses and, and, and spaces and objects and everything and shine upon them separately. That, that, that was the problem, and Rambam went so far. All created at the same time. What? All created at the same time. Yeah, so explain that to me. What, what does that mean? How can the one create many? It, it didn't make any sense to them. And they're right. Logically, there's a, there's a big issue here. The Rambam went so far. Maimonides had such a big problem with this that he says in the end that I can't find... a refutation for this point of view, but I also can't find necessary proof, meaning that it has to be this way. And since the pshat of the Torah, the literal meaning of the Torah, is that God created everything, not just that He's animating it, so therefore, for now, I don't accept the Greek principle of eternal world. I only accept that God is eternal. And the world was created. I believe that it was created, but I don't have a proof for it. That's how far the Maimonides had to go. So he had to admit that he had no good explanation for how this could happen. Okay. And now the, the Middle Rebbe is going to ta- tackle it just like the Alter Rebbe did. Just like all of Chassidus ta- tackles this, uh, this problem. What do you do with this uh, idea that the one cannot split into many? So we've answered it before. Rambam seems to, you know, don't 
far away from the uh, museum. Hmm? It sounds like there's a round down the So that's what he was accused of for 500 years. Until Hasidus came along and redeemed him. Yeah. Hasidus, until the Baal Shem Tov came along and redeemed him in that sense. And he explained why there was really a problem. But, again, the, the idea here is that it's very hard to understand how could it be that God could create separate entities? That He could create all these details? If they were already existed. How can you limit the shame? What? How can you limit the shame? It's fine. Don't limit Him. But explain it to me then. The shame is not omnipotent. I said, okay. It's not omnipotent. At the same time. So, basically what you're saying is we have to go beyond logic. Logic at least as far as we can tell, um, doesn't allow for this. The many can't come out of the one. It doesn't make any sense. So we have to go beyond logic. So let's see, how, how do you go beyond logic? What does it mean to go beyond logic? Let's take the simpler case. Whenever, whenever you have a big problem, take a simpler case. What's the simpler case? The ten sefirot coming out of the infinite light. Okay, we're just going to have ten details. We're not going to deal with the infinite many details of the world. Just ten. And you're telling us that these ten, they are like an archetype of everything that you'll find in the world. And in fact, they're like vehicles of creation. There are many things. There's only ten of them. So how can even the ten come out of the one? How could you get from one simple revelation ten separate revelations? But here we have an, an explanation. What's the explanation? Right. If you can explain it by ten, you can explain it by as many as you want. It's, it's just in steps. So like we said, if you can under, explain the ten, you can extrapolate to divine providence over every single detail. If the ten sfirot, these ten things that he created, were the same, were emerging from the Ein Sof, from the infinite, in, in, in the method or the mechanism called cause and effect, ila ve'alul. Okay? Ila means cause, alul means the effect. Then you would be right. Because there cannot be in the effect anything that wasn't in the cause. This is a little bit different than cause and effect the way that we understand it. Because cause and effect by us is that I am now lifting this cup. Nothing in my body is similar to this cup. Absolutely nothing. Except for one thing. We're both made out of matter. Okay? But as far as glass, there's nothing in my body that's glass. You know, I may have some silicon in me, but it's not in the form of glass. There's nothing in my body that's like this cup. There's just nothing in it. So when I say cause and effect, I mean just the transfer of force. So what am I doing? I have an appendage called an arm, and it has some digits called fingers connected to it, and they can grab the cup and they can lift it. So I'm talk- when we say cause and effect, we mean cause and effect in the minimal sense. Minimal sense means that all I'm doing is transferring some force. There's also cause and effect in the Greek sense, or in the maximal sense. And what is that like? That's like an amoeba dividing into two. Okay? Right? When an amoeba divides into two, what's in the child amoeba? Exactly what is it wasn't in the parent. It can't be anything different. That's what we mean by real cause and effect. The cause and effect of ilave alul, that's why it's called ilave alul, and not tzibavem suvav. When you want to say cause and effect in the scientific human, in the, in the modern science 
uh, sense, you say sibaum suvav. You say cause and effect like that. When you say ilave alul, what you mean to say is like an amoeba splitting into two. Okay, and there can be nothing in the child that wasn't in the parent. Mm-hmm. By the way, you could almost say that same thing about children. There's nothing in the children that there are even in human beings to some extent. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a combinatoric, but but doesn't mean anything. It's a, again, amoeba is a very good example. Hainu biishtavut madrega veerich bevadaya anofel kushiyatam echu bchinat erich and sofa pshut lemtziut itchalkut shu ipuch mamash merich pshitut. Then, if that's what we meant by creation, the creation could only be done in the way that an amoeba splits itself. Then they really they would be at the same level. And there could be nothing new in creation. It couldn't be something else. And so, even if you would split the amoeba a billion times, there would still be nothing new. Every single Meaning, if you would say that everything here created was created by God, then everything should have had godliness. Okay? And everything should have the ability to, to split another billion times. You should find the same qualities in everything. You understand what I'm saying? Because every other amoeba that's created has the same power to, to split itself. But that's not how the world is. The world is divided. You can't get anything from anything. Right? You can't take, I mean, it's sort of like a dream that people have. And it's a dream. People think... There's something from nothing? Yeah, no. Everything from, uh, from anything. Mm-hmm. Meaning, I'll have this machine, it, I'll put into it a cup of water... And I'll get out an automobile. <laughs> That's something from nothing. No, it's not something from nothing. I put something in. But it should be that all the matter in the universe is the same. Everything is the same. So why couldn't it be that I would just put whatever in and get whatever I want out? If you're saying that everything came from God, everything should have that quality. Because God split himself into all these things. Why, why did anything lose its ability? It shouldn't. That's in the sense, in the maximal sense. That everything should be like God. Another option is, okay, God, when he split into these different um, aspects, he, he turned off some, some abilities. Okay? So some of them were turned off. Like you get an amoeba that has split too many times, it can't split anymore. Something's turned off in it. Okay, so it's turned off. Big deal. There should be a way to turn it back on. Okay, and that's that's what's missing from the whole story. So he says, as long as you imagine the creation and the creator are the same, okay, a problem that we've already solved because you told us the answer, right? Because you told us they're, they're nothing like each other. So how did this come out? Okay, how did this come out is a big question. But they're not the same. The creation is not just a split off from the divine. Then, if they were the same, then the problem that the Greeks had would be true. But if they're different, there's no such problem, and we'll see why. Because everything that we describe as creation is only a certain revelation of godliness. In the same way that we don't see the sun itself, we only see what is what gets through the atmosphere. Right? We talked about this many times that in ancient times they thought that the um, uh, screen, screening the sun was around the sun. In modern times, we describe it that it's around the earth. It's either the atmosphere or the uh, uh, electromagnetic field around the earth. But there are many screens that we see the sun through. So we don't see the sun itself, he says. It's, a, it's an example. Shehu or chadash anolad me'etzem or ha-shemesh v'nika or shel tolada and this is called an indirect light because you're not seeing the thing itself from this light came the world not from 
the etzem, not from God Himself. It's a very important distinction. The moment you remove it once, and you see, you say this is only a revelation of godliness from which the world emerges, then you can understand that the revelation is not the same as the essence, as the thing in and of itself, as a substance. Right? The, what, you, what we experience as godliness is always a part, or as I say, instead of using a part, which is not so good, um, is only a certain aspect of what godliness is. So, for instance, this world was created with which aspect of God? With the aspect of judgment. Could God not have created a world which worked on beauty? He could have done it any other way also. He could have revealed a different aspect. He doesn't have to reveal din or judgment as the basic foundational rule of this reality that we're in. Good. So the moment that I'm choosing... What? So what, what's, what's the, the key? The key here is that he has choice. The moment that you say, say Hashem has choice to reveal something or not to reveal something, the amoeba can't choose. The amoeba just splits. But... The, but, and that was the problem. That was the problem of, 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 of the Greeks. They couldn't imagine that it was anything more than mechanistic. Their whole picture of reality was mechanistic. So the fact that God split into many wasn't a choice to split into many. It was a, a necessary natural, consequence. A natural phenomenon. Okay. It just happens. This is how it is. So what were they talking about? They were talking about nature. They, weren't, they couldn't imagine a personal God, because personal God means what? That he has, he's at least like you. You can have a relationship they with him. They didn't have anything about being called the neshama, so they couldn't possibly ever... No, they, they had very, a great deal about the neshama. They very much understood that it was spiritual and physical. They had this duality. They really didn't have a neshama. What do you mean? They understood the duality. So you can say they had a neshama at a lower level. But they had, they had a spiritual entity that they talked about. The psyche that we've been talking about is psyche. Okay. For them it was very real. They had anima. They, they, they had many things. They, they weren't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a godless world in the sense of that there's nothing spiritual. It was a godless with a capital G world where godless means that I have a relationship with this being. A personal God. Personal God, what I mean by that, that he has a person. That he has personhood. That he has in the same way that I do. He's no less than me. He's much more than I am. But he's no less than me. In the same way that I have to develop my relationship with you, I have to develop my relationship with God. That's not how you deal with nature. People, well, now people are like, they've gone a little backwards, right? So they go hug trees and think they're going to have a relationship with the tree, which is fine, okay, if you want to have a relationship with the tree. But a scientist who's looking at nature doesn't need to develop a relationship with it. And it's kind of ridiculous. What started this? That, you know, these, these uh, narrated uh, 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 movies about nature and the cheetah now feels this and feels that. The cheetah is not aware of what it feels. It just, it does what it does. And you can't describe nature as having but that's overflow from monotheistic, real monotheistic religion like Judaism, where God is personal, where, where you talk to God, where God wants something. <laughs> Nature doesn't want anything. So their mechanistic picture of godliness is what led them to not be able to explain or have an explanation involving choice that God chose to reveal part of himself. The moment that he chooses to reveal part of himself, and from that part he creates the world, that intermediate stage, where not everything is revealed, where not everything goes into reality, that was impossible for them to fathom. But the moment that you, ac that you accept that, then you get a new concept, and this concept now, he says, is called dilug, 
And that's called a quantum leap, a change. So that there's, an, as it were, there's a leap from infinite godliness to the aspect with which he creates the world. Now, if he can create one aspect, he can create ten, ten of them. לכך יכול להימצא מאור זה מציאות בחינת התחלקות אשר אינו בערך בחינת אינסוף כלל להיות כי באמת אין המשכתו בדרך ערך עצמיות אינסוף כי אם בדרך דילוג על ידי בחינת אור של תולדה כנ"ל לכן נמצא מזה מציאות כזאת שאינו בערך כלל כנ"ל. So the moment that he can make this leap and only reveal one aspect of himself you now have an opening for creating a world which is not mechanistically just a splitting of God many times. So for that, what do you have to add? You have to add the concept of dilug. You have to add the concept of skipping. But skipping requires okay, choice. It, it requires personhood. Okay. What? We started out with one that's a little bit more difficult, but we learned this last year. We did everything in here last year. We'll continue tomorrow. We'll get it. It'll get be better. Life is always about